You're listening to the Hidden Killers podcast with Tony Bruschi. Featuring attorney, guest, and former felony prosecutor, Eric Fadis. At the end of this, it, 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 I, I kind of felt like Lally was presenting a case that was better presented in closing than it did most of the, like, like should have started kind of like this. It feels like we really did this in a weird order, not super digestible to the jury. And even, I think everybody was kind of walking away going, really, this is the best we're, we're doing here? Um, it, it's, it, I don't know. It, it, I'm still kind of left confused. And if you're a juror who doesn't have all of the outside knowledge that we have and the things that didn't make it into the courtroom, I can't imagine what they're sitting there thinking and trying to figure out. Yeah, it, it, it's got to be tough. You know, they're looking at these text messages and and uh, voicemails and that kind of thing. Um, and, and it's just... Uh, the prosecution, I think, overplayed their hand a little bit and over vilified Karen Reed in ways that that might uh, not rub a juror the, uh, the right way. I, I, I still don't see how they really connect it to second degree murder. I can see motor vehicle uh, manslaughter, vehicular manslaughter. Um, I can see leaving the scene of a collision. But that's, again, assuming that she even knew that that she hit him, um, at least leaving the scene is. Um, it could be motor you know, vehicular manslaughter, even if she was unaware of it as well. Um, but even that is difficult. And the tail light is the big thing that's been in question all of this time. When was it cracked? How was it cracked? Why did we not see pieces here? Why did we not see pieces there? This is some of the closing that uh, Alan Jackson put on just the other day. Let's take a look. That tail light is cracked, but it's not completely damaged. And if there was any question in your mind about the level of damage to that tail light at 507, all doubt was extinguished when Dighton police officer Barrows walked into this courtroom. He's a sworn officer. He's not associated with Canton. He's not associated with the Alberts. He's not associated with the McCabe's. He doesn't know Michael Proctor. In other words, he doesn't answer to any of these folks. He's an outsider and he's completely independent. And his words were the following, quote, that taillight was not completely damaged. It was cracked. A piece was missing but not completely damaged. Take a look at this photograph and tell me, which one looks like Officer Barros' description? The one on the left or the one on the right? The reconstructed light on the left is what that light looked like before it was in Trooper Proctor's possession. Remember that. That's what it looked like before Trooper Proctor had access to the SUV. And you have an independent police officer telling you so. You'll recall that after John's body was discovered, Lank, a very good friend of the Alberts, walked into Brian Albert's house and had an off the record meeting with him. No one's ever gonna know exactly what that meeting was about, what they discussed, because that interview, like everything else in this case, it wasn't recorded. It wasn't memorialized. But we do know that shortly thereafter, the Canton Police Department was recused from the matter entirely. And the case was assigned to one Michael Proctor. You have to believe that when the Alberts found that out, they thought they hit the lottery. They thought they hit the lottery. What are the chances? The department where my brother works, that would have been great to investigate this case, but that, that department's been recused. That's tough luck. But the guy who catches the case is Michael Proctor, a guy we go back with for decades. At such a break, they probably thought, when this is over, we need to get that dude a gift. Oh, oh, wait a minute. They didn't think that. They said it out loud. It all happened. <laughs> That's the thing. What's the deal with the taillight? What's your take on, on what happened here with this taillight? You know, some pretty stinging accusations that Alan Jackson is lodging against uh, the law enforcement in his closing argument and really throughout the whole yeah. case. Uh, and the taillight is an enigma. It, it, it's really confusing. Um, you know, the defense did present kind of a plausible alternative as to as to how the taillight could have been damaged in the first place. And that's what juries are looking for when they're looking for reasonable doubt. They're looking for plausible alternatives. And the problem that that still lies within is the microscopic pieces of taillight that were found in John O'Keefe's clothing. That one, I mean, it's there. It's evidence. It it, it was found. It's not just some conjecture. Um, 
but again, let's also look at, at, at if you were to reconstruct this, and I'm kind of surprised they didn't attempt to do this, or maybe the, the judge said we're not going to accept it as evidence. Um, you're going 24 miles an hour, an hour in reverse. You strike a body, which is, you know, mostly water. Um, that is, you know, not a, a standing pole. It's movable. I mean, you just push a person strong enough, they're going to go back. A vehicle certainly would do that. But would it break a taillight? you know, to the way that this thing was broken. That's the other question, unless it already was broken. Was it already broken for some other reason and then it broke off more? Was the, the taillight completely gone by the time it got into Proctor's possession because the car was driven 30 miles this way and then towed 30 that way in a snowstorm? I guess that, you know, wind, it could I foreseeably see the, it's already broken coming off. Um, I don't know. There's just so many questions here. And does it really play a huge role in the crime itself. Yeah. I mean, like uh, in thinking about it and thinking about a car reversing and hitting a human body, like you said, uh, even if it's 24 miles per hour, um, it would seem like there would need to, it would need to come into contact with something rather solid and, and uh, to, to cause a crack in, in this um, back taillight, just coming into like a fleshy body and hitting it. It just uh, uh, common sense kind of tells us it's unlikely that that would cause the taillight to rupture in that. I, I wonder why would would doing an accident reconstruction would that not have been admitted into court in something like this? Oh, oh it very well could have been. Um, you know, always depends on whether the judge will allow it. Yeah. Uh, but but certainly an avenue that they could have looked at. They um, your defense did put up or or there was evidence of like a biomechanical um, expert talking about objects hitting bodies and stuff like that. But, but um, yeah, they could have gone farther with the accident reconstruction. That would have been really interesting. And I, I, I'm really wondering what side that would have worked out for. I'm going to guess the defense. Cause I just don't see, I don't know, maybe I'm completely off on this that it, you know, but it, it just doesn't seem like that makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, it, it's going to be very interesting to see where all this uh, lands here with the jury. Uh, I think, you know, we walk away from this thing. I'm feeling more confused than I did at the beginning. How about you? Uh, I'm with you. And if the jury's with you and they've been out for three days deliberating, I think we might have a mistrial or even a, a, an acquittal on our hands. We'll have to Be see. Very interesting. Sick of the ads? We are too. Start listening with no commercials now and get access to all of our episodes in advance of everyone else. Become a True Crime Today Premium Plus subscriber on Apple Podcasts. Search True Crime Today Premium Plus on Apple Podcasts or go to our podcast page and sign up now. True Crime Today Premium Plus. Sign up now.